Sticking with Ezekiel Elliott, the running back is back in the news again. This time, sort of of his own volition. We don't know what guys kind of eke out there just to let some kind of news break, some kind of information to stay on that. Sometimes you have a narrative that you want to push out there, and you want to apply a little bit of pressure to contract negotiations. Potentially, this could be one of those situations, as Zeke has reportedly privately told the Cowboys that he plans to hold out from training camp, which is less than two weeks away at this point, if he does not get a new contract. Now, there is precedent for this. Todd Gurley, the highest paid running back in the NFL right now, got his contract with two years left on his rookie deal, the same as Elliott. Now, unlike Gurley, Zeke has no significant injuries in his history, knocking on wood. Now, with Gurley's case, the Rams already have some concern. Again, there's difference in injury history there, but they're already drafting, at the very least, insurance, if not full-fledged replacement in Memphis running back Daryl. What's his name? How is his last name slipping my mind? I don't know. I'm doing this all in one go. The guy averaged nine yards per carry at Memphis last year ahead of Tony Pollard. That's all you really need to know about the insurance that they invested in behind Todd Gurley if you're the Rams. Now for Zeke, he's sitting here in this pecking order and he wants to get paid because the Cowboys have already shown they will use you up and they will spit you out. Now, there's been a lot of hot, contested debate about this amongst the fan base. People view it as Zeke as the one guy you don't let go. You let Dak Prescott walk 100 times out of 100, you do not let Zeke walk. But that does not play out with the modern NFL, and this is something that I was crying out to the heavens about before last year even started, and I had debates with a lot of guys on the show about it, uh, Law Nation, Vach Lombardi, Big Game James, and so on. I, I had this debate with people, and I think it's finally kind of playing out now where that conversation is actually being forced to be had. And James came around as well to kind of see that. He wrote back on the DallasProspect.com in February about this exact situation. I'll have that link in the description below if you want to read it. It's a great piece. Check it out. But yeah, it's, it's something where the Cowboys now are going to have to make a tight decision because in today's NFL, the running back is the most statistically replaceable position. Even the transcendent ones. I know that's not a fun thing to say. I know that it's not a popular thing to say. Trust me, I know. I've been getting killed for this for a year now, and I'm glad it's at least to the point where people are understanding it's a discussion that needs to be had. The thing is, Melvin Gordon, over with the other LA team, he looked at it and he saw the same writing on the wall. He's going into the last year of his deal, and he's like, hey, my production's been in the top three or four running backs in the league you know, since I came in. Yeah, his rookie year, he had zero touchdowns. But aside from that, his production's been right there with the best running backs. Now, what is coincidental about that? His production didn't take off to an insane level of like five yards a touch until he was built around him a solid offensive line. That was when you saw his production go off. You can be a fantastically talented running back, but if you don't have the, the blocking, then you're going to be hard-pressed to do a whole lot. That, that's just the simple truth of the matter, and you saw that take off for Gurley. Now, the Cowboys, they've invested over $100 million in their offensive line the past few years. Obviously, we know of all the first-round picks on there. You have, as well, a uh, second-round pick. Um, and Connor Williams, and now you just picked up Connor McGovern as well to give you additional support, him being, I believe, a third-round pick. So the Cowboys have invested heavily along there. They have three guys paid at the very tippy-top pretty much in their position, and another guy in Lyle Collins paid in that range. And at the time he signed his deal, I believe he was the highest-paid right tackle as well. So you've invested significantly in that offensive line. And I don't even, while I don't think Zeke was guaranteed the right pick at four he was certainly an effective pick and you look at his production up to this point yeah if you're on a rookie contract no problem with that at all the problem is when you go from that rookie contract to now wanting to be paid like Todd Gurley and like Melvin Gordon's hoping to get paid whether or not he can get a new deal done or traded to get his new deal done you run into problems at that point 
you can find somewhere in the first four rounds of the draft a running back who can give you behind your offensive line with your help at the skill positions a running back that can give you 80 to 85 percent of what Ezekiel Elliott is and if you get that you then do that for less than a let's see what's your savings you're paying him about a third of what you'd be paying Zeke probably that's a lot of value that's a lot of value to get and save money and that then lets you go save some other guys now some people think hey this should be Dak who's taking less money who should be taking maybe 25 million that might help you keep one guy but the problem is philosophically in today's NFL you cannot pay the running back that position that kind of money and you're looking at me side eye right now I know some of you are but the reason I say that is because the Cowboys last year through the first seven weeks before the Amari Cooper trade they had the number one rushing uh, Zeke was leading the league in rushing already they had one of the best running offenses in the league and yet they were 30th in points scored they were a dreadful offense despite having the league leading running back it wasn't it wasn't ending in points now some of you might want to just lay that purely at Dak's feet he certainly has his share of the blame so does the play calling so does the lack of talent at the receiver position at the time those are all valid arguments but it just shows it didn't translate having Zeke having that line did not instantly make you a high scoring offense so with that you got to pay Dak you have to I know a lot of you don't want to you have to. Not only does his resume show he's earned it, but if you want to, if you want to take a team that looks like it is capable of a Super Bowl run in the next couple of years, in terms of just the talent on paper, if you want to take that team and strip away the quarterback, a guy who is revered in that locker room as a leader, as a motivator, and all of that, and you want to plug in somebody else, be it someone a rookie or a veteran you're going to be hard-pressed to still be successful. Dak's chemistry with Amari Cooper by itself almost makes him indispensable because Amari Cooper showed last year how valuable he was. He took the Cowboys from, I think, the last in the league in terms of converting third downs to first in the league over the span of his time with the Cowboys, uh, those final, what, nine games of the regular season and then playoffs. So Amari Cooper... His value is immeasurable to this team. And with Dak, it makes a solid one-two punch. Now, you love what you got right now with Zeke, but you got two more years of Zeke as is. Zeke will probably try and hold out, as this story is talking about. But that's something we're going to have to figure out. So you got the running back who is the most replaceable because Kareem Hunt was either a third or fourth round pick. Excuse me, I forget. Kareem Hunt was a third or fourth round pick, and yet he still was a touchdown machine and he didn't even play a whole lot of games with Pat Mahomes. Some of you might think, well, it was the Chiefs offense. It was the Chiefs offense, but it was with Alex Smith as his quarterback and not with Patrick Mahomes until like the final six games of his stint with the, with the Chiefs until his suspension and everything, until he was released from the Chiefs. So that's, that's just the simple truth of all of that. But you look at it and you say, okay, you got to pay Dak. You got to pay Amari Cooper. Amari's under contract this year, Dak's under contract this year. If you had paid Dak at the start of this previous offseason, you would have paid him $26 million. That's what your going rate was then. Just by waiting until now, today, you know, again, less than two weeks before training camp, that number has now climbed up to somewhere between 30 and $35 million. You could have as much as a $9 million inflation simply by the fact that you waited and let other contracts like Carson Wentz get done first. That's bad. The longer you wait the more expensive he gets. You wait until you're already in training camp, it's going to get a little more expensive. You wait until next summer. Say, Let's say, let me put it this way. Demarcus Lawrence. Demarcus Lawrence went out there and you said, hey, you had a great year last year, D-Law. Go, go out there and prove it again. We're going to franchise you. Go out there and prove it again. Well, guess what? He did. And when a guy goes out there and proves it, the number doesn't drop. It doesn't stay the same either. It goes up. So you went from looking at paying him $16 million a year to paying him like nearly $21 million a year for D-Law. That inflation is magnified for quarterbacks. You can't let it happen. And it's magnifying as we speak for receivers too. The Amari Cooper situation, you got Michael Thomas trying to get $21, 22000000 a year from the Saints. He's going to be, Cooper is, 
in the somewhere in that range of conversation. If you can get him at 17 now, that would be a win. Dallas has to take care of those first. As Zeke's contract would come up, you have to figure out what you're going to do about guys like Jalen Smith and LVE. There are all kinds of issues. I, I'd even mention Byron Jones just because I'm of the personal assumption. I just noticed this whole time this crawler at the bottom of the screen is outdated with what I'm talking about. I digress. You have this situation where I'm under the assumption that Byron Jones will not be a cowboy. His, his lockdown corner skills are great, especially one year in, but he's not a guy that produces a lot of turnovers. He does not take the ball away. He's got like three career interceptions in the NFL. That's just not enough for me to pay at the elite level he's going to want, which is to say 13 to $14 million a year. So to me, Byron Jones is gone. But the money in the Zeke situation is going to get really interesting. My conversation originally was why it needed to be a discussion that you had about whether or not you did re-sign Zeke and the complications that would come from that. Because with the Cowboys stringing out DeMarco, granted DeMarco had a lot more injury history than uh, Zeke, and DeMarco was 26 years old in his situation, not 24 years old like Zeke is right now, or is Zeke still 23? Point being, age was different and injuries were different, so it's not apples to apples. But you still had a situation where the Cowboys said, yeah, we're not going to extend this guy, but we are going to run his ass into the ground and get every last drop of talent we can out of him before we release him back into the the free agent pond for someone else to go pick up on. In DeMarco's case, it was the Eagles who paid him top dollar and quickly regretted it and let him go after one year. That's what you could be looking at in this situation as well. Zeke, Zeke's not going to want to play out another year, let alone two more years, without some kind of guarantee. And rightfully so, because if you're a running back in today's NFL, you do not get a second big contract typically that's your only opportunity your only opportunity to make big money in the nfl it's so rare to get a third contract especially if you're a guy who came in uh touted like zeke came in as a top four pick came in led the league in rushing two of his first three years would have led all three first years had he all three of his first years had he not been suspended six games in his sophomore season but that's just reality. You have to look at the overall picture here. And the overall picture is not favorable to paying your running back $17 million a year with 40 to $45 million guaranteed. That was the discussion I started. Big Game James took it to another level, getting into specifically calling out back in February that it was inevitable Zeke would, would uh, hold out. That's what's played out here. Zeke, so we think, is saying that he is considering holding out if he doesn't get a new deal. And for a team this poised to make some noise, that's problematic. Now, do I think the Cowboys ultimately work something out with Zeke? I think they probably do. But the point that James and I were trying to make is that it's a conversation that needed to be had because it was a very real, real as a heart attack conversation and potential issue. And now that both of us have kind of been vindicated, both of us took a lot of slander just for even breathing the possibility of this. This is like a bittersweet vindication, only in the sense that now it's there and it's so real that the public can't even ignore it. So we'll see what happens. I'll keep you posted as we find out more about Zeke's situation if he actually is going to hold out or if this is just some kind of clickbait attention seeking uh, ploy by whoever reported the story we'll keep you abreast just hang tight and uh man Dallas better hope that this isn't as real or as serious as the report sounds